This is a mouth painting of mine. Oh. Uh, mouth painting? Fantastic. Oh my gosh. I'm an only child. I was born nine years after my parents were married and after a lot of tapas and temples and all that. Uh, so it was really great because my, my father was my best friend and uh, he was my guide and he, he taught me a lot of things. When I was very young, he told me that the best way to improve my language skills would be to have a diary with me all the time and note down all the uh, words I didn't know the meaning of and then to look them up in the dictionary and that way my vocabulary would improve and still today I'm, I'm continuing to do that. So he gave me, I think, all the basics, the fundamentals of working hard and being sincere and you know, uh, being on time and all those things, which uh, I feel in, in today's society, a lot of us are just not taking uh, the right kind of uh, thing to to be genuine and have integrity. So that's the one thing that I learned a lot from him. And uh, uh, when, when I was in school, actually this is what I said, when people would have us fill out these little form like things to remember us in school and whenever they would ask what is your future goal I, I would say to lead a happy and a successful life and to me happiness was success happiness doesn't mean anything that you can achieve or doesn't mean any of the tangibles and I, I, and I feel till today that my life is successful so uh, all the things that we seek in life are things like love, approval, and you know, peace of mind, and those kind of things. There's no value we can add to them. You cannot put dollars and signs, and you can, you can lie down on even a, a feather bed or whatever it is. But to sleep, you need peace of mind, and that you cannot buy. So that is what my life has been all about. I have never, uh, I was never ambitious in 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 the regular sense of the word, but uh, this is who I was. My father brought me up totally without fear. When I was just three years old, he took me to the IIT pool and I started swimming and I became a, a, a national level swimmer. Um, I have this story that I find very interesting that I li I'd like to share with you. It is a little dramatic. Um, the 1983 World Cup, I, I hope most of you will remember, was the first time India got into the finals of the Cricket World Cup. And the entire country was sitting in front of TV and, you know, desperately hoping that India would win. But there was one four-year-old who was hoping West Indies would win. <laughs> and that was more. So, um, I was a big fan of Sir Vivian Richards and uh, I was completely captivated by the way he played the game, his nonchalance and the attitude with which he played. Uh, I felt that the West Indian team was playing for pride. They didn't play for, and I didn't see that happening in the Indian squad. So, I was totally supporting uh, West Indies. And, uh, you know, as Kapil was running back to take the catch, Richard's catch, yes. you know, I became so involved in the game that when when it looked like West Indies was going to lose, the four-year-old four got fever. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so they, my father had to rush me out of the house and take me to the beach to distract me and bring my fever back down. So that was how passionate I was about cricket. I feel that there is some kind of karmic or past life connection most probably. So. Um, so I started playing when I was four years old and by the time I was eight I became the youngest uh, girl to get into the Tamil Nadu senior women's cricket team which uh, a record that still stands till date and all this happened quite effortlessly I just played because I loved the game like crazy and um, it turned out that I got into the team very early so it was great I mean uh, Sudha Shah and Sumati Iyer, people who have captained India, you know, they would wash my whites for me and 
you know make my milk and all that so it was a great experience it was great exposure um, so after that uh, when i got into swimming that was another swimming was extremely competitive in the first about 13 14 years uh, the uh, indian swimming scene is almost as ca as competitive as the us and all that and uh, i was uh, by the time i was 8 i was state first or state second in all events and uh, that really was hard because it meant 5 to 7 hours of training every day so my uh, my days would be like get up at 5:30 go for swimming finish at 7:30 and then go to school at 8 8 to 3 was school and then 3 o'clock you know my mother would actually bring everything to school and i would have my kanji or whatever and then go again to the pool so 4 to 7 was swimming and then go home do homework start the day over again <laughs> so it, it was not easy i i feel that there is no you know shortcut to to being good at anything but uh, i was given the opportunity by my parents and my father completely supported everything you know uh, being from a traditional brahmin family nobody told me you cannot play cricket it's a man's game my father would say you know even if you want to be a mechanic i'll support you 100% but you should be so passionate about it that you will become the world's best mechanic so you know that is the kind of inspiration he has always given me and uh, uh, he was really my best friend and he worked with siemens so every year we moved so the 12 years of school i went to nine different schools in three different continents and at the time i hated it because it's not easy being the new girl in school okay so but now i realize how much exposure that gave, gave me we've been we've seen most of europe we i completed school in in the us and when i completed school i was in the top 2 percentile of the entire american student population okay. so uh i was chosen for this award called the who's who amongst america students which is given to the top 2% uh which means that you can get into the top uh, ivy league schools like yale or princeton or whatever but uh, <laughs> but uh, i mean very odd to to say this but when people were standing in queues to run out of the country i chose to come back i i said i want to be an indian and i wanted play to play cricket for india very much so i actually came back um and uh, somehow you know i had always been looked up to even my teachers and you know people if you ask them i i went to vidya mandir and if you ask the teachers you know who do you think in the next 15 years or 20 years would make it big they would all have said me you know but uh i don't know life had other plans for me we didn't realize that at the time uh, i joined a five year consolidated mba course and uh, uh that was connected with the university of lincolnshire and humberside in in the uk what i wanted was at any point i could shift to the uk and complete uh, it, it would give me an international education while i could play cricket for india was was my goal and uh, in 1998 uh, i i got into the south zone squad and that was the first year and then uh, my father was in the us at the time so when i completed my first year of college i i went uh, to for the summer holidays to the us and we drove throughout california from top to bottom and um, then i came back about 4 days before uh, the next year of college was going to begin and uh, one monday uh, college was going to start and saturday they had a college excursion we went to pondicherry and uh, uh on the way back uh, there's a private stretch of beach and we we chose to play there and i was playing in about thigh deep water uh, a receding wave kind of ate the sand under my feet and i stumbled and i knew i was going to fall so i dove in and the moment i my face went under water there was a shock like sensation and then when you go into water i had started swimming at the age of 3 so i mean water was uh, very natural to me 
so when you go into water without your knowledge or without meaning to you don't catch your breath or something so the instant instinctive reaction is to stand back out so i tried to stand nothing se seemed to happen so i just held my breath and then my friends pulled me out that was it in a span of a split second life as i knew it all the dreams all the emotions or whatever it is that my parents had had for me everything was over um i broke my neck in the c4 c5 region and sustained a, a spinal cord injury that left me paralyzed below the neck i have uh, no use of my hands i cannot use my fingers and below this i'm totally paralyzed i i don't have control over my urine or bowels or uh, any of it and even if somebody were were to take a knife and cut my feet i wouldn't know uh, so a spinal cord injury is something that can happen to anyone at any time any fall any vehicular accident can cause it and there's no cure for it anywhere in the world the statistics in the in the us are that one happens every 38 minutes so it is not a rare condition there are more than a quarter million quadriplegics quadriplegics are people who have neither use of their hands or legs in the us alone but in india there are there are no statistics available uh, the government of india has not recognized spinal cord injury as a specific disability at all it is uh, grouped under orthopedic disabilities like polio or any of uh, those kind of disabilities and it's not even chosen as a multiple disability and uh, there are no there is no support available of any kind and uh, as of today uh, if there is a girl in my condition and her family cannot care for her uh, her parents are old or whatever it is they cannot care for her there is not even one rehabilitation center anywhere in india so either they can go to the streets or they can commit suicide and uh, this is uh, something i didn't know anything about actually after my accident when when i had my accident uh, at 18 uh i was totally shattered at 18 i didn't have the uh, the strength to deal with that because from where i was to to become a quadriplegic to suddenly be looked at uh, with pity or or to suddenly be studiously ignored was something i wasn't used to and i was like what i'm the same person why am i being treated differently and when people would come and uh, do that I, i felt invisible and i would start to have panic attacks i couldn't breathe when people saw me and i would you know just so you know i was like hakuna matata you know before the world turns its back on you you turn your back on the world and uh, i went into my apartment and refused to come out for 2 years apart from doctor's appointments i, I didn't want to live i didn't i just didn't i i couldn't face it and um, then my parents uh, uh, they have a very rich spiritual lineage from both sides of the family and uh, in 2000 um, our guru yogi ram surat kumar told us to move to tiruvannamalai and we moved and uh, slowly in tiruvannamalai things are even more insensitive like people would come and say idu ambliya kumbliya idu pesuma இது பொறவிலேந்தே எப்படி இருக்கா ஹவு டு யூ டீல் வித் பீங் ஆஸ்க் சச் क्वेश्चंस அண்ட் இட் வாஸ் வெரி டிஃபிகல்ட் ஃபார் மீ ஃபார் தி லாங்கஸ்ட் டைம் ஐ ஐ ஜஸ்ட் குட்ன்ட் டீல் வித் இட் அண்ட் நவ ஐ ஹேவ் கம் டு தி ஸ்டேஜ் வேர் சம்படி ஐ வாஸ் கோயிங் அரவுண்ட் ஐ ஹேவ் டன் 11 பிரதட்சினாஸ் பை மை செல்ஃப் இன் திஸ் total miracle because i i got this motorized wheelchair only for 3 years back and uh, without my finger control or anything uh, just switching it on would take me like 5 minutes and and then to push and go and you know to go to the ashram which is about uh, 300 400 meters away would take me 45 minutes i would suddenly go and be against a wall and then i would not know what to do because my hand to take my hand up and keep it on the joystick was not possible so somehow slowly i, I really feel it, you can't call it anything other than a miracle that this hand is able to push a wheelchair for 15 kilometers every time it happens it's a miracle and uh, tiruvannamalai has 
made my life full of miracles um, because uh, I've had two near-death experiences. Once in uh, 2001, uh, I was I was unable to breathe. Uh, I have this spasticity. The legs will kick about uncontrollably and they become very stiff. And when they move like that, I cannot breathe. My abdominal muscles, everything tightens and I find it very difficult to breathe. So actually my legs are tied up. I'm like a doll. You know, everywhere I made to look nice and but there is a belt going here. There is a belt tying, tied up uh, both my uh, legs and all that. So uh, when the legs kick, I cannot breathe. But that is a normal thing that happens every day. But in that particular incident, somehow uh, the spasticity went into the lungs. So the lungs became stuck together. Like, you know, sometimes plastic bags get stuck together and then it becomes like a vacuum. Like, And the more you try to blow into it, the more stuck it becomes. And so I, I found that I was not able to breathe and the more I tried to breathe in, the more uh, it was difficult. So I told my mother, Ma, I'm dying. And she was freaking out. She got chest pain and... Uh, she she has had bypass surgery since then, so she had angina at the time. Um, she tried to tear my clothes apart and give me CPR and all that. But the last thing, last conscious thing I remember thinking was, I surrender in the will of my master. And then something funny happened because I suddenly became a witness. I was able to witness my body dying, but there was no fear. I was able to feel the pain, the, the agony of the so-called death throes. My body was trying to breathe and was not able to. But you know, that is quite short. It's not that difficult. So after that, when I, after that I was gone for eight minutes and then uh, we have uh, my, my grandmother, my mother's mother is a great devotee of uh, the, the Parmacharya of Kanchipuram and she was given a, a photograph that uh, yeah, Periva himself did puja on and gave it to us and somehow that that photograph keeps bringing me back to light each time I try to go he brings me back I don't know why but um, when my grandmother brought that photo somehow suddenly the breath came back into my body and after that I found that you know whenever people a lot of us, I feel that the basis of what we are driven by more often than not is fear. We don't realize it, but I mean, the basis is fear because the earliest conditioning we receive is that somehow we are isolated. The first thing that goes in with the mother's milk is to say that I am different from you and somehow my needs are more important than yours. This, you know, as we go on to two years and three years and four years, this conditioning gives rise to comparison. Because if I need more than you, I need to know what you have. So we start comparing with others. And when we start comparing with others, naturally we need to compete. So where there is competition, automatically we, it leads to conflict. And how do you deal with conflict? How do the nations of every country I mean, the entire world, how are we dealing with conflict? We try to control. If we control everything around us, then we can deal with conflict. That is the idea. But the whole thing is an illusion. Unless we understand that we are not different, unless we, that we decondition ourselves to understand that we are part of a whole, it is never going to stop uh, being you know, somehow uh, in a conflict, in a state of conflict. So I feel that fundamentally society needs to, to change somewhere and realize that, uh, you know, success is not a place where you stand at, a, at the peak alone and look down on others. It's a very lonely place to be. Unless, you know, we decide to uplift everyone, we are not going to go up for very long. So... This is what I feel I have learned in this 
uh, and these are actually the the main things that 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 changed my perspective needed to change from why me because the whole karma theory is based on crime and punishment what have you done to deserve this i realized that when the going was good when i was top 2% and blah blah like arthur ash said when when he got aids people came up to him and said how why did you why did this happen to you and he said there are about a million people who try to play tennis and out of that only about 50000 actually end up playing and out of that only 10000 get to a competitive level they can where they can professionally play and out of that only about 100 people start playing where they can go to the uh, to wimbledon or you know to the highest level tournaments and out of that only 1% wins and when i was that one person i didn't ask why me so why should i ask why me now so i mean of course i did ask that at 18 i couldn't deal with it so i uh, what have i done i i hadn't lied i hadn't cheated i hadn't stolen i had never even thought uh, of doing anything wrong to anybody so why why me but after a few life uh, near death experiences you know you think that okay this is a special life you know because if you think most of us i don't know uh, about all of you but most people seem to never think about why we are here what are we doing here on this earth what is the purpose of our existence i don't know so other than you know yes we we need to earn money yes we need to take care of the family yes all the roles we play whether it's your designation whether you're ceo whether you're mother whether you're whatever beyond that what are we what are we doing here beyond this when this body is gone what are we going to take with us that is what i got to learn at 20 because my father told me forget about this body this body is going to go everyone's body is going to go so try to find that which cannot go which cannot be taken away from you isn't there something that you can find that cannot be taken away that doesn't change with external circumstance that cannot be altered by bad stuff because change is the way of the world chaos is the way of the world so what are you going to do when life is not going your way are you going to get unhappy are you going to get depressed are you going to you know take some medicines and go to sleep every night no now i can I, when i go to these big companies the it firms there are people of my age they are working so hard you can't buy a smile from them i'm like guys it's free smile <laughs> you can't because they are so and when you ask them what is the what is the purpose of your existence they like nobody asked us this question before we need time <laughs> even for that they want a deadline <laughs> they can't work without deadlines <laughs> so it's like i go to these places and i when i tell them hey at the end of the talk i am offering you a free hug people are like huh <laughs> and whenever i go around you know i grin at them and they are like is this mentally retarded or what there should be something wrong with her if she's smiling so much then like what is wrong with you guys why are the numbers so important that we forget here and now present moment awareness we don't have any guarantees of the next moment who knows so it's not about you you shouldn't plan but you should be alive now it's like we put our whole lives on hold for something that is going to happen at some time and like they say you know we spend our whole life trying to make a living and by the time we have enough of a living our life is gone so this is i mean this is what i learned that i can be happy when i'm just sitting in the garden watching the flowers 
there i spent nearly 10 years of my life almost in complete isolation not wanting to meet anybody nothing losing my own identity i didn't know who i was anymore was i this body was i my past achievements i was nobody then who am i so i think it's an extraordinary adventure and every day has been you know superbly it's not boring for sure so uh, but of course there have been a lot of tough things i have had to go through and uh, uh, the biggest was my father's passing away he he was only 57 he was the rock of our existence uh, my mother and i wouldn't leave the house at all so we didn't know anything i mean i had the accident at 18 and uh, you know then if i needed anything i would just say pa i need this and it would get done so i didn't know anything I, i didn't know what was in the bank account i didn't know anything and one night he had a heart attack the next afternoon he was gone he was 57 and then i found out we live in a country where to get your father's death certificate you need to pay a bribe so it, it, we were completely lost and four days after that my mother had a small attack and then we had to move to suddenly come to chennai to uh, where to go how to live uh, you know who, there was no life insurance there was nothing so how to get the money uh, which doctor which hospital some people said uh, apollo is good some people said no no and i was suddenly you know i had to stop being my father's little girl and become an adult and that was not easy and i had to start taking all the decisions in the house my mother would say ini enna decide panalo correct ah irukundi as if i knew anything but things happened in such a wonderful way that uh, i mean i think i've grown enough in the last 18 years then i would have an 18 normal lifetime so if i if you think that the 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 meaning the reason for existence is to evolve then mine is an extraordinary life it's awesome awesome, awesome. and that's the thing uh, this is another story um, my father's friend was i think agnostic or atheist or and we are brought up in this thing where after you have bath you go to the puja room and you do something there and come so when i ka- came out i was around 7 years old 7 or 8 and uh, he called me and he said okay you're doing all this when you pray what is it you pray for at 8 years old so the answer was surprising to me because i know i couldn't have come up with that answer the the the, the answer the child gave was i pray to become a blank slate <laughs> which was and i i could i would do that i would actually imagine that you know all the the good the bad everything <coughs> is gone and then this is the last lifetime and that is the only pr- prayer constant thing that has always been and uh, the fact that i have been kept alive i feel is a miracle and that i have been given uh, an opportunity to serve as, as an instrument of the divine because you know when my mother needed bypass my father's friends uh, from cg 72 they are all in very high places as most of you are also Uh, and uh, they came up to me and said what is going to happen to you if your family can't care for you and then as usual i googled only yesterday i saw this joke that uh, google turned 18 only yesterday so we've been asking all inappropriate questions of google <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah i asked the question are there any rehabilitation centers long term rehabilitation centers but i can go live with dignity and i found that in this country that is more than a billion strong and there's one thing we are doing very well is to increase our population but we are not increasing the infrastructure we are not doing anything to let people live with dignity uh, even if there is a piece of plastic on the street there is someone willing to take it and sell it and 
profit from it. But uh, like people will in alert would say, if there is a person dying on the street, nobody is willing to do anything. So uh, human life, human dignity, all that have no value somehow in our country. And uh, uh, but that, that doesn't mean I'll ever leave India. So I'm here, and I we are working hard. This is when I came out of all that. Of, uh, it was like a period of chrysalis, you know. So I came out looking in a way that people don't recognize me anymore. So mm -hmm. that much more beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so. Um, when when my father, my mother went in for bypass, she had a quintuple bypass, seven hour surgery, and uh, I don't know about time, but there's one miraculous story. Uh, when my mother, actually, when my father died, it was so sudden because he was only 57 and he was walking to the top of the hill. He pushed me in a manual wheelchair for Pradakshina more than a hundred times himself. So they were leading a life of tapas, completely sacrificing their life for me so that I may live with dignity. Never once did they think, okay, we'll put you in some home and we will continue with our lifetimes. And uh, People talk about deserving. I don't think there is anything I can do, I could have done in any past lifetime to deserve the kind of parents I've been given. They lived for me and they died for me. And my mother, my mother is still there and I wouldn't make it through a day without her. So... Uh, a lot of my father's friends, oh yeah, I was going to tell you about this miracle. So, uh, I, after my father passed away, I kept uh, pushing my mother to have uh, uh, checkups every six months. And then for after one checkup, she said, that it's not looking good, they're saying you might need surgery. And I've not spent one full day without her for the last 15 years. So, that she would be in ICU, that she would not be there to take care of me, it was... Uh, the most basic things I need help with. So to get somebody else to do that, all that was a big shock for me. But uh, again, I went on uh, on to Google and I checked about uh, angiogram, angioplasty. What is the difference between that and um, and then which doctor is good and all that? Uh, you need a cardio physician. You need a cardiovascular surgeon. And I, the only thing I knew was cardio physician and then I typed and this name came up, Dr. Satyamurti. He's a award, I think, Padma Shri winning uh, doctor who has been uh, the doctor for the president of India and all that. That only name I knew of. And how am I ever going to get an appointment with Dr. Satyamurti? He's booked, he's booked for six months or something like that. So when I came um, and uh, you know there was a lot of everyone was suggesting a doctor. So and I I didn't know anything. So then um, I got a call from my father's friend and he said, "This is the time I want to be with you. I really need to be with you, but I'm not. Uh, I have a friend of mine. His name is Balaji. He will help you. Tell me what you need." Uh, so I said, uh, "I need an appointment with Doctor Satyamurti." <laughs> And he said, okay, I'll call you back in 15 minutes. He called me back in 15 minutes and he says, you know what? Balaji is directly related to Dr. Satyamur. When do you need an appointment? I said, I need an appointment tomorrow. And I got it. <laughs> this is what my life is about. The hand of grace touches every moment of my life. Without it, I wouldn't be alive. So... I know I am not the doer, I am not doing anything. I couldn't do a single percent of the things that are happening. When we started Soul Free, okay, now to go to why we started Soul Free, we found out that there are no rehabilitation centers anywhere in India. And uh, my mother said, you start, you be the change. <laughs> this lady who is going to have bypass surgery in the next few days, saying, you be the change. I am like, Amma, are you mad? I can't do anything, you know, I cannot even take care of myself. I don't know anything about running an NGO and in India, the one who wants to do it transparently is the one who gets into trouble. 
the ones who are doing all kinds of funny business will continue they they know how to do it we don't know anything the moment i see numbers accounts and all that my brain shuts down so what am i going you need a lawyer you need an account i don't know anything i have not kept in touch with any friends i don't have any social network and in india if the right people don't speak for you nothing is going to happen so how are we going to start nothing doing i, I you know said no so then we came back after my mother's surgery 3 months we went through that somehow miraculously we, and then we went back to tiruvannamalai and 2 months later we found that in a 2 months uh, period of time three girls three paraplegic girls who, whose hands were normal and they were doing whatever they could to to be a productive and active member of their family they were told that they don't deserve to live neela yen uiroda irukka nee danda soru setru நீ இருக்கிறதுனால தான் உனக்கு அண்ணன் யாரையும் அண்ணனை யாரும் கல்யாணம் பண்ணிக்க மாட்டேன்றாங்க தம்பி யாரும் கல்யாணம் பண்ணிக்க மாட்டேன் இருக்கேன்ட்டு so that's when we started solely with nothing knowing nobody knowing having no experience nothing and they told me 97% of ngos that start fail in the first 3 years and we have just completed our 3 years and we are no way to it it was amazing because last year uh, we officially launched the website and uh, it's now being taken care of by this huge hyderabad based uh, it firm called value labs and uh, they are doing it completely pro bono for me because uh, the owner happens to be a woman cricketer uh, is harini rao she so from somewhere he we came and somehow all these things are happening it it, it is not me i nothing i can't do anything but somehow through this i am able to be the face and voice of this invisible segment of society that nobody cares if they live or die and uh, so these are the main statistics uh, that i think mostly i said it. so what we are doing is we have a two fold uh, um game plan one is prevention since spinal cord injury has no cure prevention is the only cure and uh, the emergency medical care system is so poor in india which uh, we know i'm going to have a volunteer to show you how when a person lot of uh, spinal cord injuries are having happening post accident because of wrong transport after a, uh, an accident and suraj can i have one more person okay okay please take this one so there is an accident and somebody uh, you know is is lying down we call sir yeah if you can just lift him by the hand by the hand yeah oh yeah oh uh, right. uh, they lift you yeah in india they lift them by the hands you can try with the hands yeah, yeah. Know, I, I, yeah. this is how they lift oh, and there, what this does is yeah. automatically it puts yeah, the body in this u shape yeah. and when it comes to this u shape yeah. gravity is pulling the spine down and in a injured position automatically the spine breaks and causes a spinal cord injury how many times how many accidents are happening every year we don't know how they are living we don't know how many are surviving we don't know the short term rehabilitation centers there are none there is only like cmc or you know one or two places in all of india that have reasonable uh, skills or 
there are there are only one or two i think i think till the last year or something there was no pmr specialization at all in india no emergency uh, medical specialization at all in india i think in boards here nothing so the good samaritan who pulls them out may be the person causing the damage which i've spoken to alert and alert to uh, be okay will be having a spine stabilization mo module as well so that when we go to help we don't cause more damage than good the first thing needs to happen is this but it's not happening i mean we need so much more to be done there is a lifetime of work ahead uh, we want to start a transition i, I call it transition rehabilitation centers when anybody has a life altering condition whether it's a stroke or an amputation or a spinal cord injury when it's time when you get thrown out of the hospital you are not ready for home and home is not ready for you you may be in a wheelchair most homes are not wheelchair accessible so even the parents even the caregivers don't know how to take care of you so we want to start transition rehabilitation centers where you'll be kept in for 3 to 6 months and we given physiotherapy and also counseling and uh the family will also be told in how to care for you how to get back into society how to reintegrate into uh, you know regular life to ease the transition from hospital to home we want to have at least one such center in every state of india there isn't one as yet anywhere and our ultimate goal is to have a, an inclusive township where you know persons with disability can come and live permanently and they'll be taught skills where they can uh, you know we want to start businesses that can be run by people in wheelchairs and generate our own income so that we don't have to depend on anyone for anything we my dream is to take uh, segments of society who have been discarded marginalized whether it's transgenders or women who have been raped or you know bring all these people together train them so that they can care for each other and create a, a kind of exemplary community where there is actually the sense of community where we know that we are living symbiotically and not you know eating off of each other so uh, that's the kind of place we want to build we are trying to buy land and start uh, this kind of center we want it to be inclusive and and sustainable in every way in terms of environment as well we want to use environmentally friendly things and uh, have solar panelings and that kind of thing as well so uh, this is the dream and i hope you know with this everyone support it it will come to these uh, next one. these are the kind of people we are helping uh, revathi this is beautiful young girl she was in 10th grade and 10th grade in the summer holiday she was told to carry stones and she was so thin and fragile she fainted because of the heat and the stone fell on her neck so these are the people we are helping people with uh, pressure sores who need plastic surgery and uh, there are so many more than we think just identifying them is turning out to be a big challenge for us this is murali dharan uh, murali dharan he lives in this tent like structure they don't even have a house and inr koyila or moolela or tent la they are living his father is abusive one day his uh, this is less than 6 months back uh, one day his father came and abused his mother so much that she decided to commit suicide there is only one room and one bed and the fan is above him his mother stood on the bed and uh, tried to hang herself from that fan so this guy is lying there he's a quadriplegic like me he's lying there and screaming he can't do anything to help his mother the helplessness of that there is nothing you can do to get over that so he screamed and then they saved her but then we sent him to amar seva sangam for 6 months of uh, you know we have and he is much better now but they wanted 15000 a month to take him and uh, you know it was very difficult for soul free at that time but we we said there's no other choice we have to do this so if we have our own rehabilitation center there are so many people like this we could save every day 
So this is another huge thing we are doing is, the basis is money. Uh, we have to get them to become financially stable uh, and to have their own income. So we are providing seed funding and uh, interest-free loans. And Pusari is our star. Uh, he was uh, you know, lying in bed for seven years, not doing anything. And when I asked him, he said, in the weed gramatla or maror can the Martha Kira pace it Panakech Madhyana on Tungid there. And then I said, Apopusari, a pretty Sambadi Kringa, Nathach Sapad Ringer, I asked him. So uh, he said, Ilanga, Ma Sambadi Grammar. I said, Or why, son, a carry virtue on the Sambadet and your Sapad Ringa will passing a mavi here. Then I showed him my mouth paintings and I showed him the work we are doing through Sophie. And I said, you are so strong. Your hands are so good. Why don't you do something? And now he has a least three acre piece of land and he is farming and he is employing 10 to 12 people and he has uh, grown more than 100 sacks of rice and earned a profit of more than one These are the, these are our biggest victories and I feel Given the right opportunity, everyone can do this. And one of our main initiatives is called Throat Fort. And it's uh, my, my, very close to my heart because it is for quadriplegics. The idea is to uh, uh, create voice-based jobs for quadriplegics, like RJs or TV presenters or recording of audio books or something like that. Because, I mean, people who have their hands and legs, they can get other jobs. but. We can only use our voice productively and if we are given the chance, we can also be active and productive members of society uh, is the idea. And now I am working full time and I am earning from, uh, for myself and my family. I work uh, full time using a speech activated software. I work as a writer for movies. Uh, I work for moviebuff.com. Okay. You can check it out, moviebuff.com. And uh, so, I am able to say that I don't use even one penny of money from Soul Free for myself. I can take care of my family and I feel if everyone, every quarter physic is able to say that, then that is what would make the, the biggest, that would, you know, set our souls free, literally, because our souls become imprisoned in our own bodies. And the moment we are told that we don't deserve to live over and over again, our souls just die every day. So if we are able to give people the opportunity to live their dreams, to live with dignity, to live with purpose, then uh, that would set our souls free and that's what soul free is aims.